first next slide. Um, before we get started into the treatment, um, let's talk about whether CHF visits have increased in recent years. Uh, I'd like to uh, see what you think, whether they increase, stay the same, or decreased. So generally, people think they have increased. Okay, um, are we, uh, has everyone voted on that, Shelley, or shall, shall we go to the next slide? I believe that's everybody voting for the same thing, yes. So we could go to the next slide. We did a study of looking at the ED visits and intubations for CHF, and we found that they declined. Let's go to the next slide. You can see that uh, as a percent of total ED visits, the CHF visits went from 1.6 down to 1.1, which represents uh, quite, a, quite a, a large decline in the CHF visits over the years. Next slide. And this is the intubations. The intubations went from 3.5 down to 1.5, so they, they've gone in half. So we're getting better at uh, treating these patients. Go ahead. Uh, basically, there's a whole uh, number of, of new uh, of drugs to treat uh, uh, CHF. Uh, this is on an outpatient basis. Basically, Carvedel is a, is a beta blocker. And then you have enalapril, which is an ACE inhibitor, and there's various other drugs. And they all help at the 4 or 5% level. It's all less than 5%, but combined, they are causing uh, less CHF visits in, 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 in the people who have C, uh, exacerbations of their CHF. Uh, they're less severe. Next slide. Let's uh, talk about this case. A 62-year-old woman presents with acute onset of dyspnea. Her pulse is 110, it's a regular rhythm. Blood pressure 240 over 120. Respiratory rate is 36. The pulse ox is 88% on O2 by mask. And in the chest, she has rowels in all lung fields. Next slide. So this lady is in acute pulmonary edema with elevated blood pressure. What's the most common etiology? Is it fluid overload or is it fluid redistribution and increased vascular stiffness? Well, that's, that, that's pretty good how people, uh, I can see exactly how many people are voting here. This is. This is uh, very, uh, very good. I, hope, I was glad you liked it. Yeah. <laughs> and sorry about my dog. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, uh, most people uh, are saying uh, fluid redistribution as opposed to fluid overload. Okay. Um, Okay, so let's go to the next slide. This um, is a article that talks about the pathophysiology of acute heart failure. Is it all about fluid accumulation? Next slide. They propose two primary types of acute heart failure. One a decompensated heart failure characterized by deterioration of cardiac performance over days to weeks. And then you have acute vascular failure characterized by acute hypertension and increased vascular stiffness. Next slide. They suggest that um, 
uh, some of our traditional faults, such as fluid accumulation, ischemia arrhythmias, may play a limited role in the initiation of the syndrome, whereas other mechanisms, such as increased vascular stiffness and fluid redistribution, may play a larger role. Next slide. Uh, the uh, patient that the cardiologist takes care of and that uh, cardiologists generally give this lecture are people who uh, have been, uh, uh, shall I say, uh, not eating appropriately over the holidays, overdoing it. And we, we looked at this, we looked at increases in emergency department visits for congestive heart failure during Christmas and the New Year's holiday season. Next slide. And, and this is the ratio of daily visits for CHF to the average daily for CHF in December and January. See that uh, on the Christmas holiday, which is 1225, um, it goes up to uh, almost to 35% uh, more. And uh, New Year's, it goes up uh, again, 35% more. So people are, uh, shall I say, uh, eating, uh, eating too much and eating salty foods and uh, the uh, congestive heart failure visits uh, go up. Go ahead, next slide. So what, what is more effective in treating severe acute pulmonary edema? Is it diuretics or nitroglycerin? Okay. Uh, it looks like uh, most people believe it's uh, diuretics. Let's uh, go to a, uh, uh, a paper that examines this issue. Uh, this is a randomized, this is diuresis uh, versus vasodilatation, a randomized trial of high dose isosorbide dinitrate, which is a, a nitroglycerin type medicine, plus low dose furosemide versus high dose furosemide plus low dose isosorbide dinitrate in a severe pulmonary edema. And uh, the authors here, one of these authors was a resident of mine. Uh, actually, he was an internal medicine resident, Ido Kaluski. And uh, one night he saw me treat uh, a patient who came in and looked like they needed to be intubated. And uh, I came out 20 minutes later and said, the patient's better. I think you should keep the patient overnight. Uh, and uh, or you can send the patient home. And he said, you gotta be kidding me. So uh, when he went back to uh, Israel to do his cardiology fellowship, he uh, did this study. So let's go to the next slide. This was a randomized prospective Israeli study uh, initially, they administered 40 milligrams of IV furosemide. Next slide. Patients were then treated with either high doses of IV nitrates combined with low dose furosemide or high dose furosemide, 80 milligrams every 15 minutes with low dose nitrates. Next slide. There were 104 patients with severe pulmonary edema, and these were the mean total doses. The high nitroglycerin received 11.4 milligrams of isosorbide, and uh, the low nitroglycerin group received 1.4 milligrams of isosorbide. The furosemide in the high nitroglycerin group was 56 milligrams, and the furosemide in the low nitroglycerin group was 200 milligrams. Now, I don't know what you use in, in 
that part of the world, but isosorbide, the typical dose that you use for a patient who's having an angina attack is, is 2.5 milligrams. So you're using pretty high, these are pretty high doses of, of nitroglycerin in the high nitroglycerin group. Next slide. So the high dose nitroglycerin group has significantly better outcomes. The percent intubated in the high nitroglycerin group was 13%. In the low nitroglycerin group, it was 40%. The percent myocardial infarctions were 17% and 37%. Now, these are, are large differences. You saw the difference that those other medicines made in uh, patients with uh, CHF. They were 5% or less. Here, the differences in the percent intubated is 27% and the percent with the my myocardial infarctions is 20%. So these are, are big differences. So nitroglycerin clearly wins out here. Next slide. Um, this uh, was a study that was done uh, earlier and, and sort of uh, had a tremendous effect on the way I practice. Uh, medicine uh, in treating uh, acute pulmonary edema patients. The effect of sublingual nitroglycerin in the emergency treatment of severe pulmonary edema by Busman and all. The only intervention they used was nitroglycerin. Next slide. They had seven patients with pulmonary artery catheters uh, or Swan Gans catheters. The pulmonary artery wedge pressures started at a mean of 30 milli, millimeters of, of uh, mercury. The only intervention was 1.6 milligrams of nitroglycerin. That's, that's equivalent to four tablets. Next slide. Within five minutes, the pulmonary artery wedge pressures decreased from a mean of 30 to a mean of 21. This the, uh, 21 is the upper limits of the normal range. It's it's uh, dramatic the effect that this nitroglycerin had on on these patients. Next slide. There were 15 patients without pulmonary artery catheters. They gave doses from 0 0.8 milligrams to 2.4 milligrams in intervals of 5 to 10 minutes. And after 15 to 20 minutes, the rouse disappeared or decreased in 11, and the dyspnea decreased in 14 of the 15 patients. So this is, this is a dramatic effect. The RAC improvement was attributed to nitroglycerin alone as no other mechanical or pharmacological interventions were used. The mechanism of action is probably it dilates the venous system, which causes a decrease in the left ventricular filling pressures. Also dilates the arterial system, causing decreased left ventricular work. Next slide. Okay, we have, we talked about nitroglycerin being so effective. What about BiPAP and CPAP? Are they effective in treating acute pulmonary edema? Well, it looks like everybody uh, thinks that they're effective. No, okay. There we go. A couple of no's. <laughs> okay, you got a couple uh, no's. Okay. Let's, uh, let's, uh, okay, it's going up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. There you go. Well, um, let's uh, let's take a look at. Uh, most people feel that it's effective. Let's see whether it's effective. Non-invasive ventilation, in acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema, systematic review and meta-analysis. This was in JAMA 2005. They compared. They compared. Uh, compared different techniques, oxygen by mass versus CPAP and BiPAP, 
and they also compared CPAP versus BiPAP. BiPAP here, uh, they, they use the expression non-invasive uh, pulmonary support uh, ventilation. Next slide. Uh, this is a complicated slide, but the basically, let me call your attention. This is uh, very complicated, but I can uh, uh, summarize it very easily. Uh, the, uh, the first set is the need to intubate. And uh, uh, you have a line, a vertical line. And if it's to the left of that line, it favors non-invasive ventilation and the other one favors just oxygen. So you can see that the studies generally uh, favor uh, uh, continuous positive airway pressure. Now, the next set is the BiPAP or non-invasive pressure support ventilation. And again, you can see most of the studies are to the left of the line. So it looks like there's less intubations when you use either BiPAP or CPAP. So let's go to the next, the next slide. I was highlighting what you were discussing. <laughs> yes, it's all to the left. You can see all the studies show that there's uh, less intubations with BiPAP in, uh, with CPAP, which is on the top, and BiPAP, which is on the bottom. Okay. Next slide. Oops, sorry. Next no, slide. And then when you looked at uh, more, uh, uh, okay, the top one is, uh, is CPAP versus BiPAP, and you can see that uh, that's uh, mortality. And there's really no difference between CPAP and BiPAP. Uh, the, uh, the summary uh, shows that it goes through uh, one. It's, it's, there's no statistically significant difference. And the need to intubate, again, uh, there's, there's, it goes through that vertical line, which means that there's no statistically significant difference between CPAP and BiPAP. So basically, this study shows that in terms of mortality and in terms of need to intubation, CPAP and BiPAP are better, but there, there really no, there's no difference between CPAP, which is continuous pressure, versus BiPAP, which is a bi-level uh, pressures. Uh, there's no difference between them. Next slide. Well, that's what we thought, and we thought this was uh, put to rest, and then there was a paper, non-invasive ventilation in acute pulmonary, uh, uh, cardiogenic pulmonary edema. This was by Alistair Gray et al. in New England Journal of Medicine in 2008, and this study was much larger than all the other studies. This was over a thousand patients and it was standard oxygen versus BiPAP or CPAP. Next slide. Okay, now you can see that uh, there's the standard oxygen delivery and there's CPAP and BiPAP. In death in less than seven days, 9.8% in the standard group, 9.5% in CPAP, BiPAP. There's no difference. Intubation rates. 2.8% versus 2.9%. No difference. MI, 24.9 uh, versus 27.0. No difference. In the ICU emissions, there, there was 40% uh, and 45%, maybe 5% more were emitted with the CPAP BiPAP. So basically, in things that are important, death, intubation, MI, ICU emission, there's, there's little difference between standard oxygen and CPAP and BiPAP. 
The secondary outcomes, CPAP and BiPAP showed greater improvement in, in respiratory distress. But the important things that are important to the patient, there was no difference. Next slide. So non-invasive ventilation in, induces, their conclusion was non-invasive ventilation induces a more rapid improvement in respiratory distress than the standard oxygen therapy but has no effect on other important outcomes. Next slide. Now this is a, a complicated slide, but uh, I draw your attention. There's a vertical line and you have all the studies there. And when you add in the uh, gray study, uh, which is about the, uh, the eighth down there, uh, there's there's little difference between uh, CPAP and BiPAP. It may may improve things slightly. So uh, I guess uh, uh, next slide. Okay. So uh, basically, in terms of CPAP and BiPAP, I would say that uh, they may cause slight improvement in respiratory distress, but important patient outcomes, there's no, there's no difference. So let's, let's talk about uh, our BiPAP and CPAP better than nitroglycerin. Okay, it seems like uh, on, uh, I've convinced people of the nitroglycerin story. Uh, uh, most people believe that uh, nitroglycerin is, uh, is better. Uh, let's go on and see if we can find a study that will address this issue. Okay, high dose intravenous isosorbide dinitrate is safer and better than BiPAP ventilation combined with conventional treatment for severe pul uh, pul pulmonary edema. And again, uh, the internal medicine resident who saw me treat uh, acute pulmonary edema patients uh, just with nitroglycerin uh, was one of the authors on this. Let's go ahead. They uh, had 114 patients and they uh, randomized 40, one into high dose IV nitroglycerin, the other one into BiPAP with standard therapy. Next slide. The BiPAP group, uh, basically it was an isosorbide group uh, initiated at a low rate and increased slowly every five to 10 minutes. The high dose IV nitroglycerin bolus group was given as four milligrams of isosorbide IV boluses every four minutes. That's sort of uh, double the usual uh, dose that you give orally to, uh, to a person with angina. Go ahead. During the first 24 hours, the combined endpoint of death myocardial infarction or intubation, 85% of the BiPAP group in only 25% of the high dose nitroglycerin group. Now that, that represents a, a tremendous difference. There's 60% difference in those combined endpoints of death, myocardial infarction or intubation. So uh, nitroglycerin clearly uh, wins out here. Next slide. These findings suggest that intervention to decrease vasoconstriction and increase, improve cardiac output with the administration of high dose nitrates are more effective than attempts to improve oxygenation with non-invasive positive pressure in patients with severe pulmonary edema. Next slide. So which is more effective, the high dose Boluses of nitroglycerin are continuous IV nitroglycerin. Okay. 
uh, it looks like most people are believing the continuous IV nitroglycerin. And uh, I would say that uh, many clinicians use the IV nitroglycerin uh, uh, continuously. Uh, some use the high dose boluses, but let's take a look at the evidence here. Well, we couldn't not get uh, approval from our, our human research committee to do a, a randomized controlled trial. So what we did is we just did a, a case series. This is intravenous nitroglycerin boluses in treating patients with cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Next slide. We had 24 patients that received an aggressive IV nitroglycerin bolus regimen in, in addition to furosemide. 66% of the patients had significant improvement within 20 minutes, 83% improved within 30 minutes. And importantly, uh, clinicians are concerned about hypotension occurring if you use too much nitroglycerin. There was no hypotension that occurred. Next slide. Um, we did this study and uh, one, uh, Philip Levy came by and uh, saw us, uh, we presented this at a meeting and uh, he works in a uh, hospital where there are many patients who come in with blood pressures of 250 over 150 and acute pulmonary edema. So he saw our study and he said, I, I have to uh, do a look at this. So he looked at the treatment of severe decompensated heart failure with high dose intravenous nitroglycerin. Next study. I mean, next slide. This was, again, he could not get uh, approval from his human research committee. So it was non-randomized, open label, single arm study of high dose nitroglycerin. Uh, and they used an historical control for comparison. Next slide. Inclusion criteria was a systolic blood pressure of greater than 160 millimeters of mercury and refractory to initial therapy. Next slide. They did nitroglycerin infusions and then IV boluses of high dose nitroglycerin. Now, he started out with two milligrams. Now, uh, typically you give 0 0.4 milligrams so uh, uh, for angina. So that's like five, five times the normal dose that you would give for a patient with anginal symptoms. And uh, he repeated this high dose nitroglycerin every three minutes up to a total of 10 doses. So he's giving like five nitroglycerins uh, every three minutes up to a total of 10 doses. These patients that he's taking care of, mind you, are, are very sick with very high blood pressures. Next slide. The mean dose of the high dose nitroglycerin was 6.5 milligrams. So you're talking about uh, uh, 16 times the uh, normal dose that you would give for a patient with angina here. So he's given large doses. So he's had, let's look at the high dose nitroglycerin group. There was 29 and then the historical control there was 45. The percent intubated was 14% in the high dose nitroglycerin group and 27% in the control. Uh, the BiPAP use was 7% in high dose nitroglycerin versus 20% in the control. The ICU emissions were much less, 38% in the high dose nitroglycerin group, 80% in the control. Symptomatic uh, decrease in blood pressure where the blood pressure uh, drops uh, quite a bit was 3%, uh, was essentially one patient. 
and the myocardial infarction was 17% versus 29%. Next slide. So the high dose nitroglycerin was, uh, the study wasn't done in an ideal fashion. It wasn't randomized, uh, uh, blinded, et cetera. But uh, the high dose nitroglycerin group was associated with less adverse outcomes than without high dose nitroglycerin and the adverse events were uncommon. And he uh, says that a randomized blindness study is needed to complete the finest clinical utility. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, talk about a patient that I would see typically and how I would treat it. A 62 year old female presents with acute onset of of dyspnea, the pulse is 110, it's regular, blood pressure 240 over 120. Now, how would I treat that patient? Let's go ahead to the next slide. Well, they arrive in the emergency department and their blood pressure is, is 240. Okay, I would give 0 0.8 milligrams of nitroglycerin and I'd recheck the blood pressure. By the way, um, Sometimes you can't get an IV in, and uh, or you can't get the uh, uh, IV nitroglycerin going quickly. So I would just go ahead and start with sublinguals. I'd give two sublinguals to the person, and after five minutes, their blood pressure would be 200. Uh, you're going too fast, there, Shelley. Sorry. Uh, uh, then I would, uh, I would check their blood pressure after 10 minutes. And if it was still elevated at 180, I'd give another 0 0.8 milligrams. This is two tablets. And after 15 minutes, their blood pressure is still up. I'd give them 0 0.8. And after 20 minutes, uh, their blood pressure comes down to 120 and uh, we're done. The patient is, is better. Uh, you can keep them in the hospital overnight. Uh, in fact, uh, many of the patients say, can I go home, doc? You made me better. So the total nitroglycerin given over 15 minutes is 3.2 milligrams or the equivalent. Uh, I use nitroglycerin spray. You can use, a, you can use the, uh, the sublingual tablets. The sublingual tablets uh, take an extra minute to work. But uh, uh, you give 3.2 milligrams or eight nitroglycerins and uh, essentially in, in 20 minutes, the patient is better. Next slide. Uh, what about morphine? Uh, I know that uh, this was an old treatment. Uh, Hoffman uh, looked at this uh, he compared nitroglycerin, morphine, and ferrosamide in treatment of presumed, and th this is pre-hospital pulmonary edema. We have paramedics who go out in the field and they call into the doctors at the station and uh, the doctors direct them on how to treat the patients. So uh, the doctors are not in the in the pre-hospital setting in our country, uh, but they direct the care over the phone. Uh, next slide. Uh, this was a block design. It was not randomized with 15 patients in each block. Now, the reason they had to do that is because again, they couldn't get permission from uh, the Human Research Committee to do a randomized trial. So they compared four treatment protocols in the pre-hospital setting of, of, of pulmonary edema. In group A, it was night. No, no, I'll go back to that slide. Oh, it's, okay. it's the same groups. That's why okay. I just left the poll. Okay, group A was nitroglycerin plus Lasix. The second group was morphine plus Lasix. The th third was nitroglycerin, morphine plus Lasix. And the fourth was morphine plus nitroglycerin. So the question is, is which group did the best? And it looks like, uh, it looks like most people like uh, 
like uh, some morphine thrown in. Uh, oh, uh, some people, uh, it looks like uh, people, uh, okay. <laughs> things are changing quickly. <laughs> yep, things keep changing. <laughs> They're answering, it's well, live. Well, that's uh, this is quite uh, this is quite interesting here. Uh, okay, so it looks like uh, uh, most people like some morphine thrown in. Uh, uh, oh, maybe not. <laughs> it's okay, changing. <laughs> it's changing. Okay. Uh, well, uh, let's, uh, uh, let's see, well, uh, so, uh, there's a, a good part of you like some morphine thrown in, although uh, it looks like most people like it. So let's go, let's look at the percent intubations. Nitroglycerin plus Lasix, there was just zero of them were intubated. Morphine plus Lasix, 31%. Nitroglycerin, morphine plus Lasix, 7%. Morphine plus nitroglycerin, 7%. So B, C, and D all have morphine in it, and they had some intubations. The nitroglycerin plus Lasix, there was no intubations. So basically, uh, morphine doesn't look like it. It works, it works well. Uh, nitroglycerin uh, is, seems to be uh, uh, key here. Uh, it seems like nitroglycerin wins out again. Next slide. So nitroglycerin most beneficially should be the primary component of pre-hospital therapy. Morphine may be deleterious and furosemide may not add anything to the efficacy and may cause problem with fluid and electrolyte management in some patients. That's what their conclusions were. Next slide. ACE inhibitors uh, for chronic CHF used extensively. You saw that uh, it helped by 5%. Uh, in the previous slides, it reduces mortality, improves exercise tolerance. Next slide. What about acute pulmonary edema? Do ACE inhibitors improve outcome at one hour in flash pulmonary edema? It's amazing how this. Uh, this moves around. <laughs> yep. All based on the real results. Mm. Okay. That's, uh, so mo most people think that uh, it works uh, if you give ACE in inhibitors when a person presents with flash pulmonary edema. So let's look at the evidence. This was a study by Hamilton, rapid improvement of acute pulmonary edema with sublingual captopril. Next slide. Patients were given captopril, had statistically better scores during the first 25 to 40 minutes of therapy. For the remainder of the time intervals that were examined, there were no statistically significant differences. So it seemed to help from 25 to 40 minutes, but in one hour, there was no difference between the groups. Next slide. Okay, this is a, a study that we did in a place called Chennai, um, India. Uh, it used to be called Madras. It's in Southern India. The temperatures there get to 40 degrees centigrade in the summertime. And uh, uh, does, you know, does living in such a warm climate, uh, uh, does that put an extra stress on the heart? 
and do do hospital omissions for congestive heart failure increase with increasing temperatures in a tropical climate. And these these temperatures these temperatures are warm. I mean, uh, it, it seldom gets to that level in uh, in where you folks live. So we're saying that um, most people feel that uh, hospital emissions increase. Next slide. This is a study we did. Hospital emissions for congestive heart failure decrease with increasing temperatures in a tropical climate. Let's go ahead and see what the results show. Um, you have on the left axis there, the ratio of the monthly CHF visits to the average monthly visits for CHF. Okay, so that's on the, on the Y axis on, on the left. And the Y axis on the right is the average temperature. And the X axis is the month. And one would stand for January, two would be February. Now you can see that um, the dotted line is the temperature. And the average daily temperature in January and uh, December, which is 12, is about 29 degrees centigrade. The average daily temperature in May and June is above 37 degrees centigrade. So that's the average temperature. I mean, you can imagine what it is in the daytime there. It really is very, very warm. And you can, uh, now the solid line is the uh, ratio of CHF visits to the average monthly visits for CHF. And you can see that in January and December, they go up, they're 30% higher. Whereas in the months with the higher temperatures, they drop by up to 30% or more than 30% in, in June. Uh, so this shows that the high, higher temperatures are associated with less visits for congestive heart failure. Next slide. Uh, so uh, b basically from, from that study, we conclude that there's a lot of vasodilatation in the summer, in the summertime, and warm weather, and vasodilatation uh, 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 perhaps is associated with less uh, congestive heart failure. Okay, the summary of recommendations: nitroglycerin beneficial, particularly in large doses given in boluses. Hypotension from nitroglycerin uncommon. CPAP and ACE inhibitors might, might provide slight benefit. Uh, next slide. Uh, can anybody tell me uh, where this uh, was taken? Where this picture was taken? There it is. No, uh, it's the arches. Uh, somebody, uh, someone got it right. This is the Arches National uh, Park in Utah in the United States. Uh, thank you. Um, are there any questions? Awesome. Thanks, John. Uh, that was really 
helpful and really cool to see all the research that was done. So guys, if you have any questions, you could go to that link um, to send in the questions and you can vote questions up to the top of the leaderboard if you want them answered. Uh, so we'll answer questions for the next like five minutes and then we'll take a five minute break and then uh, we'll do our last lecture for the day. We're getting a lot of thank yous. <laughs> Oh, lots of thank yous. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for your attention. Awesome. We'll leave the questions up here during the break. So if you guys think of anything, you're more than welcome to have them. Uh, but we're going to just, just because we're running a little late on our schedule, we're just going to uh, do a five minute break right now. Um, our next lecture I saw came in. Uh, Fatima, are you here? Yes. Hi. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so we'll just have them have a five minute break and then we'll get started on your lecture. Okay. Awesome lecture, Dr. Allegra. Thank you. So we'll reconvene here at 12.05. Well, that's our time. So wherever you are, five minutes after the hour. All right. Shelly, what time is it in Sophia now? Uh, so right now it's uh, seven o'clock in Sofia and in the UK it's five. And if people are in Central Europe, like Macedonia, North Macedonia, it is six. And yeah, exactly. All, all my people are responding to me. <laughs> and how many people, um, uh, what per, uh, percentage of the people watching this are in Sofia? I have to do the math. Um, I would say a probably around like 70%, if not slightly more. And where else in the world are they listening to this? Um, so we had uh, students from all over. I could actually show you. Give me one second. Um, just want to All right. And yeah, so let me show you. Um, new share. Share. There we go. Hold on, gotta stop and restart. New share. There we go. Share. Oh, well, you guys see this, the original PowerPoint? There we go. Um, so these are our students um, of who pull, we pulled in the morning of what year they are. So we have some medical graduates. We have uh, mostly fifth year medical students. Um, and then our next one, these are where people are tuning in from. It was an interactive slide that they got to click on. Oh boy, that's, uh, yeah. that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Oh, there's, some, there's some in India, and yeah, and uh, what is that, Nepal? Uh, maybe I think. <laughs> I was like, it's kind of like on a border, <laughs> but yeah, pretty cool, right? Germany uh, is that Sweden or? Yes, yeah, so we uh, have some people from Sweden. That's uh, pretty impressive. Yeah. So. Anyway, so I will bring up Fatima's lecture because we're going to be starting in two minutes. I think there's one question. Uh, oh, is there a question? Oh, can you come back to the questions? Yes. Let me go back to the questions. Thank you. Uh, okay, and there we go. Hold on, I gotta end this PowerPoint first. 
cancel that and do share. Share. Okay. Do you guys see the thing right now? Hopefully. There we go. There you go. So, table with questions is open. Uh, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the best treatments are for for COVID. Uh, we know that uh, in certain patients, uh, steroids work. Uh, the question is, what do you think is it better, ventilators for COVID or filtering the blood? Uh, I'm not sure what what treatment for. The uh, the steroids are probably good in certain patients. Uh, uh, the article on steroids was uh, it was a well done study, but everything else uh, um, haven't been good studies on. So uh, I, I'm not I'm not sure. Uh, it appears that once you put the patient on a ventilator, the mortality rate is, is very high. I think uh, you probably want to put them in a prone position uh, first before you put them on a ventilator. But that, that, yeah. that's a, a very difficult thing. I, I'm not sure. Um, we have another question coming in. What do you think about the combination of metalozone and furosemide combination for acute pulmonary edema, effective or not in clinical practice? Uh, I, I think that nitroglycerin works so well. You can take a person and, and who comes in that looks like they need to be intubated and in 20 minutes, you can turn them around. I, I, I it, it's, uh, it's dramatic. Okay. And how many people with congestive heart failure develop uh, pulmonary edema? Like, do you have percentage per yeah, year? They, uh, with all these new medications, uh, all helping a little bit, people are on multiple patients. They all help. A little bit, and so the number of people that we're seeing with heart failure has gone down dramatically in my lifetime uh, doing emergency medicine. When I started, uh, there wasn't one night that I didn't have a patient that came in that was in severe pulmonary edema that I ended up intubating, and, and frequently they'd end up dying. And now, uh, seldom do you see that. Uh, so, uh, uh, in theory, we learned diuretics, okay, our, okay, in theory, we learned diuretics are the gold standard for edema. So, you would conclude that nitroglycerin is optimal. Yes, I think for uh, acute pulmonary edema, the uh, nitroglycerin is optimal. If you have a person who is on, uh, uh, you know, if a person comes in and they've uh, uh, been uh, having increasing edema over a period of several weeks, then I would, uh, that's the patient that you need to give uh, more diuretics to. But if a patient develops acute pulmonary edema, I think the nitroglycerin uh, is the way to go. Awesome. How difficult does to make diagnosis and treatment as a number of different pulmonary edema has different causes and how uh, do you determine the best plan of action? Uh, that's a, uh, a good question. Uh, actually, uh, I had a, I had a slide on, uh, on how to make the diagnosis of pulmonary edema. And uh, I took it out 
because it didn't uh, address, uh, directly address the treatment. But uh, it's, it can be difficult. Um, the, uh, probably the best is a chest X-ray, but uh, the presence of rowels, uh, jugular venous distension, all these things help a little bit, but uh, nothing is, is definitive. Uh, it's, uh, you know, and, and then again, if you have a person who comes in with low pressures and they're in pulmonary edema, that uh, is heart failure uh, at its worst. And those, those people are very difficult to treat. What I address is, is people uh, coming in with high pressures and they're in pulmonary edema. The low pressure pulmonary edema is is a different a different approach, and uh, we didn't address that here.